Aside from calling Blake Shelton tone deaf for saying that his love is so powerful, his wife looks uh, makes him feel rich on a minimum wage, uh, it has bounced around as a political football for years, especially acute now uh, with uh, President Biden uh, saying that he wants this to be part of the stimulus package, becomes a bone of contention. They start making it out uh, yet again that conservatives that oppose this kind of thing are ghouls and we just want people to be homeless in the street and all the other hair on fire rhetoric that unfortunately has always been standard operating procedure when uh, higher minimum wages are discussed. Joining us now on the phone from the Cato Institute, where he is the director of tax policy studies and the editor of downsizinggovernment.org, he is Chris Edwards. Welcome back, Chris. How are you doing, sir? I am good. Thanks for having me, Joe. Not at all. Uh, I mean, it's like they're painting some Disney movie depiction of what life with a $15 an hour minimum wage uh, is. Start in first and foremost, they say everyone... It needs more money to get by. Is just hiking the minimum wage, aside from the fact that your check's larger, is it actually going to make you have, quote, more money? It will make some people have more money. The problem is it would be hugely damaging, particularly for the lowest skill uh, entry-level young workers. So the Congressional Budget Office, uh, in a new report earlier this week, found that raising the federal minimum to $15 an hour would lose 1.4 million jobs. Those would be mainly low-skill, entry-level jobs. For young people, workers age 24 and younger are 58 percent of minimum wage workers. And here's the thing, you know, they need entry level jobs to get basic skills and start climbing their career ladder. I mean, I remember Mm -hmm. when I was young, I had over a half a dozen uh, entry level jobs like busboy, and they were very useful because they teach you about the business world and give you basic skills. Mm -hmm. The problem with raising the minimum wage is, is it would break the bottom rung of the ladder that people need to start climbing to start their career. It would make it much harder for young people to get a toehold in the job market. Mm-hmm. And I'll just give you a, uh, a, I'll give you a Milton Friedman quote on this that captured it exactly. Milton Friedman, the economist, said, quote, the minimum wage law is most properly described as a law saying employers must discriminate against people who have low skills, unquote. You pass this 15 dollar an hour federal minimum and particularly in the lower income states in the, in the south and elsewhere uh, it'll it'll be a reason for many businesses to fire their least skilled uh, workers and eliminate job opportunities it will be very unfair well you bring up the the most salient point in this is that it, it's going to harm the very people that the people who are promoting the fifteen dollar minimum wage have been campaigning for at least this last election cycle and really for most of my adult life uh, portending to care the most about that's exactly right in my new uh, op ed at the uh, publication the hill I've got you know some quotes from Joe Biden during the campaign he said for example, he promised to create jobs for young adults to reach full employment as fast as possible. It would do exactly the opposite. This would eliminate jobs for for young adults. Uh, He also promised in his so-called Build Back Better plan to help small businesses recover from the recession. Raising the minimum wage would do exactly the opposite. It It would damage small business in particular, because about half of all uh, minimum wage workers work at companies of less than 100 Mm -hmm. uh, workers. And and that's because small businesses generally pay lower wages and have more entry-level jobs than than the big corporations. So this federal policy, this federal minimum wage increase, it would be a huge policy mistake. It would damage uh, the the least skilled entry-level workers, and it would uh, greatly damage small businesses, particularly labor-intensive small businesses like restaurants. Well, and you look at what they've already suffered under with COVID-19, businesses that can't work from home, uh, businesses that often require people to work in customer service as best they can in a, a pandemic that we don't know how some of this stuff gets transmitted. Uh, you know, we we say heroes work here, yet you know we're going to drive them out of the workforce because these companies are not going to be able to afford uh, the staffing. 
That, that's exactly right. In fact, you know, with the restaurant industry, everyone knows it's been, uh, you know, it's been a real apocalypse, in, as mm-hmm. particularly in the states and cities that have done the most aggressive shutdowns. There's a, there had been uh, earlier in 2020 650,000 restaurants in the United States. Uh, over 110,000 of those now, it looks like, have closed uh, permanently. So it's been a terrible year, of course, for restaurants. Raising the minimum wage, you know, will make it much harder for, uh, you know, new restaurants to start. America needs over 100,000 restaurants, you know, in coming months to fill the void of all the shutdown restaurants. Raising the minimum wage to $15 will just make it that much harder for these restaurants to open. We're visiting with Chris Edwards, Director of Tax Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, downsizinggovernment.org. He mentioned that he's got a publication, uh, an op-ed in The Hill, on this $15 an hour minimum wage hike. Many other countries around the world do this, and and I think most notably uh, the timeline of Venezuela mandating higher minimum wage. Uh, then, Then after seeing all the businesses just fold that into the costs of whatever they were charging, leaving, for the most part, a zero-sum game, Um, they instituted price controls, which then led to the food riots and businesses closing and mass unemployment. Is that a scenario that we could be headed towards where, you know, if if the minimum wage is forced on businesses and they fold that cost into the consumer, uh, you know, that that the president might try to mandate wage uh, price uh, controls? You point to something which is, a, you know, a broader problem with government intervention. You know, every government intervention creates these negative ripple effects across the economy that create all this other damage. So, you know, you pass this $15 an hour minimum wage hike. The CBO says that will lose 1.4 million jobs. And then the, the, everyone on the political left will say, oh, we've got all these young people who are unemployed. We need to pass more spending subsidies to give them training. But, you know, the market way of training is to get people employed starting at the bottom of the career ladder, Mm -hmm. train them on the job, and they get more skills, you know, gradually over time, like most of us who have, you know, um, progressed in the workforce, that, you know, most of the the training and knowledge you have comes from jobs you've had. So, you know, the problem with raising the minimum wage is you're going to, you're going to knock out this these first entry level jobs where people gain business experience, you know, they learn they learn about different careers and industries and they learn what they want to do in their life. Um, and uh, it, it would be really tragic and, and unfortunate. Hey, Chris, earlier on, you mentioned a statistic about the number of young people that are working at minimum wage and the number was 58 percent. And I wrote it down because it struck me as an incredibly low number for an economy, but it makes sense considering how we've become more and more of a service sector economy, uh, that more and more adults are trying to live on minimum wage. Is that a broader economic problem that the president and his economic advisors really should be looking at is how many non-young people are trying to live on minimum wage? You know the way to the way to raise wages for everyone. We saw before the pandemic started. 2019 was some of the strongest economic growth that was raising all boats. If you go back and look at uh, census data for 2019, wages were rising across the board. Um, traditionally disadvantaged uh, groups, their wages were rising quickly. Uh, the the uh, growth was raising, uh, you know, the boats, uh, all boats. Mm-hmm. And so that's ultimately what we want here. We want market-led growth that creates broad prosperity for everyone. And, and you know, that's what we had before the pandemic. I fear that all these interventions uh, planned by the new administration are going to uh, start destroying a lot of these uh, opportunities and will undermine growth. Um, and that'll be, you know, and that'll, you know, as you pointed to, it'll unfortunately cause them to, to try even more interventions, which are going to cause even more damage to the economy. So th- it would be a negative, you know, real spiral for the economy if we start going down this path of $15 an hour minimum wages and all these other interventions. He's the uh, editor of DownsizingGovernment.org, director of tax policy studies at the Cato Institute, Chris Edwards on Freedom and Prosperity Radio this week. Chris, 
as the director of tax policy studies, it's funny that they still do this. What what you've mentioned, the millions of people who will lose jobs with a mandated $15 an hour minimum wage will create the need for more government programs, as you said, whether it be training or just welfare and extended unemployment. And, and at the same time, therefore, strain the tax rolls, which means we'll have fewer taxpayers fewer failing uh, to be able to make any uh, uh, dent on the tax rolls. So we're absolutely going to have to have massive tax hikes, uh, either on business, on estates, and on citizens in general, aren't we? Yeah, I, you know, this is this is the the battle that's coming down the road. Is the the uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, candidate Biden and now President Biden is promising a huge array of tax increases uh, on business, but that just means that businesses, uh, if you raise taxes on business, they're going to be able to invest and hire uh, a lot less. So that will be, uh, you know, a very damaging uh, development uh, down the road. Uh, but you know, it's about. I, I suspect the administration won't uh, be picking this battle initially. It looks like they just want a whole bunch of more uh, spending initially. Uh, but ultimately, you know, spending is a cost, and it's a cost where you know we push forward onto young people in the future if we're borrowing all this money. So the more we borrow and spend now, the higher taxes are going to have to be later, uh, which will create this you know damage, you know, rising damage to the economy down the road. Well, it it also it creates, and maybe we've just forgotten during the ten months of the COVID nineteen shutdowns that you know the government just doesn't have magic money trees. Uh, I thought we had made some headway in in spreading that message, that gospel. But heck, I even hear Republicans saying, "Yeah, boy, we're going to have to send another one point nine trillion dollars into the economy." And and, and you say, from where and and yet you you you've nailed it it seems they they just are going to keep spending and devaluing what's there in the first place it's uh it's really sad what's gone on the you know a couple decades ago well, b- both parties in congress were, were feared uh, deficit spending because they thought it would create political damage for them. But because the federal government seems to be able to borrow endlessly in global capital markets and the Federal Reserve makes it really easy for the federal government to, to borrow, unfortunately, they're just, they just love spending both parties in Washington and, uh, they're, they're pushing, uh, the, the government, you know, to essentially the bankruptcy down the road where this can't go on forever and it will end. It'll end in a crisis. No one knows when it's going to happen, but uh, but but unfortunately, that's that's where we're headed. Is it something that could put our reserve currency in peril, Chris? Uh, because I, I keep being told by economists that well, we'll be okay as long as we're the reserve currency, and I always hear that word as long as that phrase as long as just ringing out from the midst of that statement, uh, and and I, I worry that at some point. Whether it's the yuan or not, uh, maybe it's Bitcoin. I don't know. Something's going to replace us as the reserve currency of the global markets, and then we're done for, Chris. As far as I'm concerned, economically, and I, I, I can't even imagine what kind of riots will come about if the government goes into that kind of spiral. Yeah, I mean, the, the fear is is that foreign creditors, about forty five percent or so of all federal government debt, is we borrowed from abroad. So in the future, young Americans will be working harder and harder, and more of their earnings are going to get taxed, sent to Washington, and then Washington's going to be paying off foreign creditors in Asia and Europe and elsewhere. So that's that's how the you know the standard of living of young people is going to be reduced in the future because of all this debt we're loading uh, onto them. And then at some point, foreign creditors are going to look at the United States and realize we're not a good credit risk. They're going to start pulling back their U.S. investment. U.S. interest rates are going to rise. The, the central bank, you know, the fear would be that they start uh, they start trying to monetize the debt. Inflation will rise like we saw in the late 70s. Uh, and, uh, you know, that'll create a crisis for the economy. You know, a decade or so, uh, a decade ago, we saw Greece go into that sort of a, a debt spiral crisis. And their economy still hasn't recovered from that. The Greek economy, they, Greek has a, Greece has a, a lower standard of living today than they did 15 years ago before mm. their debt crisis. So the problem with the debt crisis it'll, is that it'll create long-term damage, lower the standard of living for, for uh, you know, all average Americans because we'll be taxed more, 
the money will be uh, have to, will be siphoned out of our economy and paid to foreign creditors. And be worth less in the first place. I mean, you know, the the one upside is people say, well, inflationary trends tend to help get the debt down faster. I'm like, well, that's great for the people who are trying to buy bread uh, and you know fill you know, fill their family's shelves. It, yeah, right. No, inflation is a tax on modern income people more mm-hmm. than every more than everyone else. It's a tax on you know the private sector in in general. Uh, because it means that people have to pay more to get real goods, but it particularly harms uh, lower income people, as as you pointed out, who have to buy necessities uh, like food and food and housing. Well, and that becomes the the catch twenty two of a higher minimum wage. You know, we'll give you more money; it's worth less, but it, it, you'll have more of it. And I guess the pyrrhic victory is you just feel better in some Keynesian uh, Disney movie. Yeah, that that that's right. It's it's we don't want to go down that 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 road. And uh, I sure wish the Republicans would stand up to some of the spending. I was appalled to see a few weeks ago when ten Republican senators stood up and said, "Oh, we don't want one point nine trillion more in stimulus spending. Uh, we want six hundred billion. And for goodness' sake, we don't. There's still tens, hundreds of billions of dollars in the pipeline of spending that they've already done for relief." Um, you know, the pandemic is, is, you know, hopefully starting to wind down. We don't, the state and local governments are actually doing pretty well on their budgets. We don't need more billions mm-hmm. of dollars of spending from Washington. The Republicans ought to be standing together and saying, no, no more. We've, we've, uh, we're imposed, we're already imposing too much debt mm-hmm. on young people. It's really unfair what's going on. And here's something people don't, think about very much is that, you know, young people in the future will have their own crises to deal with. There will be health crises in the future. There will be military crises. There will be natural disasters that will be costly. So people in the future will have to pay the cost of their own crises, and they're going to have to pay the cost of, of all this debt we're imposing on them for our crises. It's completely unfair. So uh, we, ought to, we ought to stop all this, all this really damaging uh, deficit finance spending. Chris, last one for you. Chris Edwards, Director of Tax Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, downsizinggovernment.org. What about the ramifications to the unions uh, when you when you mandate a lower floor? I guess that, as far as I understand it, what's going to happen is all these union contracts are going to be inflated by whatever the percentage increase from the minimum wage is. That's right. The politics of a minimum wage are is that big. Some of the big corporations have who already pay fifteen dollars an hour because they can afford it. They come out in favor of uh, raising the minimum wage to try to squelch their competitors. Uh, completely unfair. It's the same for the unions. The unions figure that the the more the minimum wage goes up, ultimately their union wages will go up more. And here's the thing about the minimum wage: we don't need the federal government in this policy space uh, at all. State governments are free to impose and uh, their own minimum wages. Twenty nine states have already have mm-hmm. minimum wages higher than the federal government seven twenty five an hour. I don't agree with minimum wages at all, but at least we should leave this policy to the states because the states are radically different on they have radically different economies. And just to put one data point on that, in Massachusetts in twenty nineteen, the average wage was thirty one dollars an hour. In Mississippi, it was $19 an hour. That gives you a sense of the vastly different wage wow. structures in the different state. So, try, different states. So, trying to mandate a you know a single uniform minimum wage across the country makes absolutely no sense. Uh, you know, and one of the great ironies is the Democrats are always the ones claiming they're for diversity and they're for community and they're for the local democracy and the like. Well, a national mandated minimum wage destroys diversity and destroys local uh, democracy. Um, let you know. Let let the states lead on this. We don't need the federal government intervening. Chris, thank you so much again. You said your uh, op-ed is at uh, thehill.com. Uh, and, of course, find most of you, editor-in-chief for downsizinggovernment.org, director of tax policy at the Cato Institute. Uh, Chris Edwards, thank you so much for joining us this week on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you for tuning in this week to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. For all of us here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy, I am Joe Thomas. Until next week, so long and thanks for all the fish. Thanks for all the fish. Thanks for all the fish.